All right, so then we'll get into this. Uh, the next question was about ETV, so endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Is this considered as the first preferable treatment option for anyone with hydrocephalus? How do you determine who is a good candidate and why choose uh, an ETV over a shunt? So great question. So just so everyone's aware of uh, what an ETV actually is, um, if we have here a um, uh, slide of somebody with hydrocephalus, um, the, the, here you see a situation where the fluid is blocked here. So as Dr. Parent was saying, this is a, a uh, non-communicating obstructive type of hydrocephalus. And so the fluid is all built up up here. And uh, we could put a shunt into these ventricles and, and drain the fluid that way. Uh, or we could uh, put an endoscopic uh, camera through the uh, brain into the ventricles and then make a hole here at the lower part of the third ventricle and that forms an internal bypass so that all the fluid that's blocked up here that normally should be flowing out this way but can't, can now flow out this way, okay? So that's what an ETV is. And um, when I think about um, assessing a patient with uh, hydrocephalus and deciding about ETV, I think the, the, the two questions that, that I pose are, one, is the anatomy suitable? Um, and that means, um, can I actually do the ETV safely? Because there may be things on the anatomy of that patient that make an ETV just out of the question anyway. Uh, and then the second question, if that threshold is crossed, is um, should we do an ETV on that patient? Is it the right decision for that patient if you look at the totality of their uh, picture? So in terms of the suitable anatomy, the things that we uh, look for are we need to place a, an endoscope into the ventricle. So the ventricles have to be a, at least a minimum size. So it's very difficult to do this in somebody who has uh, small ventricles. Um, so that's one thing. And then similarly, um, the, the next stage of this operation after you get the endoscope into the ventricles is to actually make that hole in the floor of the third ventricle. And so the things that I would look for there is, is that floor thin enough um, that it would be safe to make a hole through it? Um, is the angle of the floor good? There's a number of other nuances that we would look at to determine whether it's safe to make that hole. And then I think about what am I gonna see after we make that hole? On the other side of that, is, is, it, is there a safe landing pa uh, pad basically on the other side? How much space is there? Where is the major arteries in that area? Is there a lot of scarring? All these things um, uh, we look at. So as an example, this is a, a child with hydrocephalus in here. This is the uh, floor of the third ventricle, and it's a little bit unusual. It's nice that it's bowed down, which is what we like to see, but I, I don't like this angle here. It's, a mix, it's gonna be a quite a difficult one, and I suspect there's some scarring underneath here. You, you probably don't appreciate this, just me telling it to you, you just have to take my word for it. Um, there is, and, and similarly in this one, this is another uh, case where um, the floor of the third ventricle looks very nice. It's nice and thin. Uh, which is what I'd like to see. The angle's good. Uh, but what I worry about here is that there's not a lot of space um, in, in this area. I'd like to see more white here. And uh, as well, there is uh, evidence that there may be some scarring in this. This one, we, we, um, we actually attempted an ETV on, but we, because I wasn't sure if the scarring was there or not, but um, uh, scarring was in fact there when we, when we went. Um, but you, that, so that's the question of whether you can do the ETV. Should you do the ETV? Uh, comes down to, I think, some issues about the, um, uh, the patient circumstances. And that relates primarily to the age of the patient and the, what the cause of their hydrocephalus is. The best case scenarios for ETV, meaning the, the situations where ETV um, has the highest success rate, are older children or adults who have a pure, um, obstructive, non-communicating hydrocephalus. So some sort of a, a discrete blockage from a, uh, whether it might be a tumor or a congenital blockage um, of that fluid, okay? Anything that's different from that, meaning a different type of hydrocephalus or a different age, uh, particularly infants, um, then they are less than ideal candidates for ETV because they, we know that the success rate is lower. And um, you know, this is one way to, to quantify the success rate. We've, this is for children, uh, the CTV success score, and you get scores that get higher as you get older and they get higher as you change etiologies or causes of hydrocephalus. So the worst case scenario is post-infectious hydrocephalus and then things like myelomeningocele and intraventricular hemorrhage are, are next worse. And then the best are the aqueductal stenosis and what we call tectal tumors, okay? Um, and then that, that quantifies how, uh, what the chance of success is with ETV. And if we compare the results um, for shunt versus ETV on patients who would have been good ETV candidates, so they have a high success score, we can see that in fact they actually do quite well. So what these are, 
These are curves that tell you how quickly uh, you fail your procedure. All right. So um, if you failed, um, sorry, my cursor doesn't show up. Okay. Is there? A, there's not a pointer here. Anybody have a pointer? No. So th th these curves, as you see them go down, um, uh, a very poor procedure, one that fails a lot, would have a, a, a curve that goes really steeply down. Okay. Uh, one that's perfect would be a straight line right across the top. Um, so you can see that ETV and Shunter are neither perfect nor terrible in this group of patients. Um, but you can see that ETV is a little bit higher, okay? So lower uh, failure rate, higher success rate. Um, so th this is a, this, and this is the type of patients that we're talking about who are the older patients who have that um, discrete obstructive hydrocephalus. This is the best case scenario for ETV. Um, if you look at um, patients who are, are less good candidates for this, so they may be slightly younger, they may have a different t cause of hydrocephalus. Um, this is what those curves look like. So here, they're, they're, the curves are a bit closer together. ETV does a little bit worse early on, as you can see, but then they kind of overlap. So not much of a difference in this, uh, in this sort of middle group. And then when you get to the, the patients who are the, the worst candidates for ETV, and these are, unfortunately, the, the majority of patients that we see, because these, these are almost all infants. Right, because that's the strongest predictor of, of uh, failure with ETV is, is being very young. So uh, this is what the curves look like there, and you can see the ETV curve drops off uh, dramatically very early on. So very high failure rate early on, um, and uh, and the shunt also you know drops off a fair bit, but but there is that gap where shunt seems to do better um, in this group of patients. So the, when you look at those curves, you know why do we consider ETV at all? I should mention it is a riskier procedure to do. So as an actual operation, um, the risks of the actual operation are a little bit higher than with shunt. Um, so we know that. We also know that it has a higher failure rate in many patients. So why do we attempt it? Uh, well, part, some of the reasons are one, it, it does have a lower infection rate uh, because we're not leaving any foreign material in, in the patient. So the infection rate is lower. And as well, the uh, late failure rate is lower. So. This is, a, this is a kind of hard curve to, to, um, to, to grasp, but what it's basically trying to show you graphically is that over time, so if you go from uh, left to right, that's uh, years from surgery, years after your surgery, whether it be shunt or ETV. Um, on the vertical axis going up and down is how, uh, what your risk of ETV failure is compared to shunt failure at any point in time. So what it's trying to show you is that early on, um, in that left part of the graph, the, um, the curve is fair, the, the, the line is fairly high, which means that um, your risk of failing with an ETV is higher than with shunt. So early on, shunt is actually better. Okay, your rate of failure in the first few months to a, you know, maybe three to six months is actually higher with an ETV than with a shunt for most patients. But the, the reason we consider ETV is that after you cross that six month threshold, Look what happens to that line, it goes way down, which means that at two years, three years, four years, or whenever, you can still have a failure with the ETV. It still may not work and you may need repeat surgery, but the chances of it are lower than with a shunt. So that, that's sort of the trade-off. You take, um, with an ETV, you're taking more early risk because there's a higher chance it's gonna fail. But if it, if, it, if it doesn't, if you're one of the patients in whom it doesn't fail early on, then you probably have a lower risk of, uh, of ETV failure when you're five years out uh, than having a shunt failure when you're five years out. So that, that's how we, how we look at it. Um, and any comments from the adult perspective on that? deal with is, though, is, a, is a relatively unique group of individuals. Um, um, first of all, to go back to some of the anatomical stuff that Ab was starting to talk about, um, when we, th we talked about hydrocephalus being um, a buildup of fluid inside the head, and what does an ETV actually do? If we look at the diagram on the far, far left, silhouetted inside the head are the ventricles. The C-shaped cavities are the, what we call the lateral ventricles, and they feed into that middle cavity, which is the third ventricle. And in the middle picture here, you can see fluid is supposed to get out of that third ventricle by going through a little canal into the fourth ventricle, which is that little triangular shaped structure, and then it's supposed to come out the bottom end of that. A very common condition we see is aqueductal stenosis or aqueductal narrowing. So in the, the far right picture, that canal narrows. Of course, in the setting where that narrows, then the fluid builds up behind that. And this, this area right here is the floor of the third ventricle. And 
and all we're really doing is making a bypass. So you poke a little hole, fluid gets out, and it just resumes its journey over the top of the hemispheres. And, and that's why it makes intrinsic sense to do this in an individual who has blocked shunts, or sorry, has a obstructive hydrocephalus. So you make a hole right through that opening there, and that should get you in. So um, it creates a new pathway for the CSF to flow. Therefore, the ideal individual would be somebody who has a blockage of CSF flow. And uh, one would have thought aqueductal stenosis is commonly thought of as a congenital condition, and indeed it is. Um, but in the adult world, as I was starting to say, you know, we see in, uh, several distinct groups of individuals. Of course, we see the transition individuals, so people who have had hydrocephalus since they were born, but treated with a shunt, sometimes many shunts, and then they now graduate into adulthood, and they're no longer looked after by pediatric neurosurgeons, so we inherit a group of individuals who have hydrocephalus that's been treated. And where we get involved is that their shunt starts to malfunction. Um, I personally dislike shunts. Um, and I think anybody who has a shunt dislikes shunts. shunts. A shunt is a mechanical device. And you feel like your life and your health is dependent on this mechanical device. And indeed it is. And they're designed well, but they're not perfect. And as we age, we have to assume they're, you know, they just don't have the ability to last for 70 or 80 years. So we're inevitably uh, in the cycle of replacing shunts. And it's hard to predict. We have individuals who can go for the better part of their life with a shunt that functions fine, and others who will have repeated malfunctions. So my, my goal in life is to destroy shunts one at a time. <laughs> so every individual that comes through the door with hydrocephalus is somebody I would look at as a potential candidate for endoscopic third ventriculostomy, or ETV, and then try to tell my, uh, convince myself that I should not do it, rather than to convince myself I should do it. The obvious low-hanging fruit are patient, individuals who have aqueductal stenosis. Um, in adults, we'll see tumors, posterior, uh, tumors at the back of the brain that will also cause a similar condition. But it's become evident that there's a number of individuals who have what we traditionally think of as communicating hydrocephalus. Um, infants who have had uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, so what we refer to as post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. Infants who have had um, infections like meningitis, so they have post-meningitic hydrocephalus. And the anatomy would suggest that this is communicating hydrocephalus. And there's been some interesting work that's come out of, um, of all places, places like sub-Saharan Africa, where the idea of putting a shunt in is cost prohibitive. They simply cannot afford to put shunts in. So um, they put, they've been doing ETVs over and over and over again. And what we've learned in these groups of individuals is that anywhere between half and two thirds of these individuals may in fact be adequately treated with an ETV. So it's certainly something we explore in adults who come um, with these conditions. So the, the, the easy one is the aqueductal stenosis. And in adults with aqueductal stenosis, um, the success rate is exceedingly high. We're up in the 80 or 90% long-term success rate. Uh, for other conditions like uh, uh, communicating hydrocephalus, um, it's a lower success rate and shunting may be better, but it's often a discussion I'll have with individuals to say we could look at doing an ETV, accepting that there may be a 30 or 40% or 50% failure. But the upside is if you're 25 or 30 years old and you're one of the 50%, in fact, that we can eliminate this shunt, it's a huge win for the rest of your adult life. Um, the other condition that is unique to adulthood is this condition of normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is a condition that's becoming more common um, as the population ages. The, uh, the uh, baby boom bubble is getting older and older, and this is a condition we see in people who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, where the ventricles enlarge. There is no obvious reason why that should be the case, and they develop a syndrome that's characterized by um, a loss of cognitive powers, um, difficulty controlling urinary uh, their urinary control, and uh, walking difficulties. So they often start off with walking difficulties, balance difficulties, gait difficulties, um, will go on to develop problems with urinary control, problems with cognition, and that triad uh, alerts us to the fact that it might be NPH. Um, the imaging will show they have big ventricles, and this truly is um, communicating hydrocephalus. And right now, it is a little controversial uh, what the role of ETV might be. Um, there are some places that do it, and there's certainly um, evidence that there's some success in doing it. Um, the, con the problem I have when I've done it is that if somebody improves a little, you're never certain whether they would have improved more if you do a shunt, so you're always weighing out the relative merits of doing one versus the other. So the, the jury's out on that condition right now.